Good morning, River's Edge. We welcome any guests with us this morning. I know we have some. And anyone watching online as well, if this is your first time, we welcome you. And you're welcome to come here with us in person. Psalm 62 calls us to worship the living God. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Let us take a moment now of silence and have a reverent time of anticipation before we sing to our King. Lord, we have come to worship you and you have called us to worship your holy name. You are the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us now to worship in spirit and truth. Lord, help us, as the Psalm says, to trust you at all times. And may we now pour our hearts out before you that our lips and our hearts would sing your praise. And it's only through Christ that we can come to you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father of glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us each and Sacred witness bear in this glad hour, thou who almighty art now ruling every heart, and then from us depart, spirit of fire. Draw near your throne, but Father, you love. 
and in God before you made the world's foundation. You predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown, and you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. But I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The spirit you made. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven set us in by grace and grace alone So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone I will run the race by grace and grace alone I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone By His grace, you may be seated. This time we will have our Puritan catechism as we continue to learn the truths of Scripture through the oral teaching. Question 72. How is the Word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching of the Word, an effectual means of convicting and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith to salvation. Amen. And we will have an opportunity for you to worship through your giving at the end of service as we have been doing at the back there. The ushers will be at the doors on your way out or you have the option to give online. You can find the link there on the church website or the Facebook page. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sang of your grace and how you have worked in our lives for those who have trusted you, how you've brought us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And Lord, you've forgiven us of our sins and given us your righteousness. But yet, Lord, we know that we are free from the power and the penalty of sin, yet we so easily are entangled, we so easily start to put that yoke of slavery back on. And so, Lord, we take this moment to confess our sins to you, the sins of this past week, the sins of even this morning, Lord, knowing that you are faithful and just to hear us and forgive us and cleanse us of all, of all unrighteousness. So we take a moment now to confess these sins to you silently and specifically to you, Lord. God, hear the prayers of your people. 
Give us true hearts of repentance, true sorrow over our sin, the sin that put you to death on the cross. But Lord, you rose victoriously and you give us the power now by your spirit to put to death the deeds of our flesh. So help us, Lord, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself for we cannot do this apart from you and we have failed miserably. Forgive us for thinking we can do it apart from you. Thank you that you cleanse us of all unrighteousness and that we stand not condemned before your throne. Lord, bless your people this morning as we continue to sing your praise, continue to hear your word and worship you in all that we do and think and say. In Christ's name, amen. In this time of desperation, all we know is doubt and fear. There is only one salvation. This broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see, there is only one foundation, we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ.
statement of faith, the word made flesh. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us, crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, your worship uh, honestly brought me to tears. Still uh, holding it back a little bit, your outpouring of worship to Almighty God. Um, and I dare not take credit, but I felt such a feeling of pride as you sang to the Lord. Um, the Bible says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. The gathering of, of God's body, of the body of Christ, the gathering of the saints, uh, it's special to us, isn't it? It means much to us. Well, we we got my daughter Maggie married yesterday to Brom, so we're very thankful for that. Uh, it was my heart is full, as you can imagine, and I'm very tired. And it's a good thing that I'm not preaching today. So I'm very pleased uh, that such a rare time that I get to spend with my son. I haven't even had much time to spend with him uh, since he's been home because of the wedding, but um, I'm very pleased that he can be with us here today. Could, would you come up, Graham? Please give my son Graham a big hand. I'd like to pray with him before he gets started as he delivers God's word to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word and how it feeds us and nourishes us and sustains us, guides us and gives us direction. We thank you for the Holy Spirit 
that helps us understand it, that uh, fills us with that knowledge that we might act in wisdom in our daily activities. Lord, thank you for Graham, who has submitted his life to your holy word, to Jesus Christ, his Lord. I pray that you would speak through him by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that we would, would grow today, these moments, as the very words that come from your mouth are like bread to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I don't know about bread. I feel like I've had enough carbs this week at this wedding. But I am grateful to be able to be here with you all, I've seeing so many familiar faces whom I have loved and who have loved me for so many years, and to be able to be here and experience the means of grace with you to preach the word of God to you this morning is a great privilege for me. So if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Hebrews chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 16. It should be page 1003 in the Bibles that are provided for you in the seat back. So Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 14 through 16. It doesn't take a lot to figure out what our needs are, does it? We tend to be pretty good at that as a species, figuring out what exactly we need. And we generally come by that knowledge intuitively. You know, if I'm hungry, I need food. If I'm poor, I need money. If I'm lonely, I need companionship. What's not as easy to figure out and what's not as easy to know is how to meet those needs. I know my needs, how do I meet those needs? Of course, we may think that we know how to meet those needs. If I'm hungry, I'll just head down to lefties and grab myself a foot long, right? Or if I'm poor and I'm lacking money, I'll try to get a second job or get on unemployment or something like that. I can meet those needs, I can figure those things out. Those are generally a little bit easier to figure out. What about when you're confused? How do you find clarity? You need clarity. Well, how do you get it? What about when you're addicted? How do you find freedom? That's not as easy to, to come by, is it? When you're suicidal, how do you find joy? When you're dying, how do you find vitality? You see, we, we know what we need, but we don't know how to get what we need. And the truth is, as good as we are discovering what our needs are, we're just not that good at discovering how to meet them. So simply put, we need help, and we don't know where to get it. And that's exactly what our text this morning addresses. So if you've not turned there already, please turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respects has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may, we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This morning the author of Hebrews is telling us in Hebrews chapter 4 that because Jesus is our high priest, we can confidently take our needs to God and find mercy and help from him. Again, the author is telling us that because Jesus is our high priest, we can confidently take our needs to God, and we can expect to find mercy and help from him. And so I want us to pay careful attention to three specific themes that we find in this text. First, the priesthood of Christ. Second, the needs of believers. And third, the help that comes from God. The priesthood of Christ the needs of believers, and the help that comes from God. Our author quickly identifies Jesus as our great high priest. And this, this designation, this title, is packed with significance. If you've been reading through your Old Testament, and even if you've just stuck to the New Testament, you can understand some of the significance that is there in that title, high priest. And to understand what a high priest is and to understand that Jesus is our great high priest is to understand in a significant way the way in which God saves his people, the way in which God brings his people to himself, the way in which God relates to his children whom he has adopted. But to understand the significance of Christ as our high priest, we have to go back to the Old Testament and look at the Levitical high priesthood. 
The Israelites were chosen by God as his specific people. They were his chosen people, his chosen nation, and they were enslaved in Egypt. Egypt signifies the land of death, the land of sin. It's the land of, of slavery. And they're delivered from the land of death. They're delivered from slavery, and they're brought out into the wilderness. They're brought to Mount Sinai. And God repeatedly tells them, you can see this throughout the first five books of the Old Testament and really all through the prophets as well. God tells them that repeatedly that they will be his people, that he will be their God, and that he will dwell in their midst. And this is the great blessing of being an Israelite, that you will have God in your midst, that you will be able to dwell in God's presence. And of, as the people of God, of course, our, our great blessing that we have received is that we can be in God's presence. We can come into God's presence. We can commune with and have fellowship with our God who has saved us. Being in the presence of God, being God's people, was the great blessing of Israel. And so as they come to Mount Sinai, God gives them the law, the moral law written on the Ten Commandments and the, and the tablets of stone. He gives them the civil law, how to govern their nation, and he gives them the ceremonial law, the sacrifices that they're to make to atone for their sins. But in the middle of that, at the end of the book of Exodus, he gives them directions for building the tabernacle. The tabernacle was this tent structure. It was a three-tiered structure that was basically God's house. The Israelites were a nomadic people. They, they traveled around the wilderness and they lived in tents and God himself lived in a tent in a tabernacle in the middle of the camp. Again, this is the great blessing of being an Israelite. And we read at the end of Exodus, the very last chapter, God's presence is on Mount Sinai. God brings Moses up there. God speaks to Moses. You can see the glory cloud there. And at the, the end of Exodus, the glory cloud departs from Mount Sinai and comes into the tabernacle that the Israelites had recently just built. And that's God's presence. That's God's house. It's a three-tiered structure. And on the outside, there's the outer courts where the Israelites come and they make their sacrifices to atone for their sins. And then there's the holy place where only the, the priests can go into the holy place. That's where the showbread is and the lampstand and some of these things that we're familiar with as we read through the Old Testament. And then there's the most holy place, or the, the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, there's one thing, and that's the Ark of the Covenant, sometimes referred to as the mercy seat. It's, it's God's throne on earth. It's, it's the place from which God dispenses his rule and his judgment. It's the place where, where God lives on earth. And of course, we know that God is omnipresent. God lives all places. God is all places at all times. Yet his special covenantal presence is there with Israel. And no one else has access to that special presence other than the Israelites. And, and no one can go into the Holy of Holies but the high priest. The high priest, Aaron, goes into the Holy of Holies, goes into God's presence and once a year. He has to cleanse himself. He has to, to sacrifice a goat and he has to sacrifice a bull to atone for his sins. And he has to sacrifice a, bo a bull and a goat to, to atone for the sins of the Israelites. And after he's done that, he can go into God's presence. And as, as the high priest goes into God's presence in the Holy of Holies, he is the representative of the entire nation. And it's as though when the high priest goes into God's presence, all of Israel is going there with him. All of Israel comes into God's presence. All of Israel communes with Yahweh and has fellowship with Yahweh and does that which they were created to do, to enjoy the presence of God. This is all a type. It's all a shadow. It's a foreshadow of the great high priest. The great high priest who the author of Hebrews speaks of here in Hebrews chapter 4. And the, the high priest could only go into the Holy of Holies if he was completely cleansed of his sin. Why? Because God is a holy God. And to say that God is a holy God means that he is antithetical to sin. He is the opposite of unrighteousness. And for, for unrighteousness, for sin to come into his presence, it is destroyed immediately. So if the high priest comes into God's presence in a sinful manner, with sin that has not been atoned for, God strikes him down dead. And we see this in Leviticus 11. The sons of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu go into God's presence with strange fire. And what happens? God sends a fire out from the Holy of Holies and destroys them. 
And so you can imagine the great trepidation and even the fear of the high priest as he goes into God's presence one day a year. Boy, I hope I did everything right. But I hope my sins have been atoned for in the correct manner because if not, my sinful self cannot stand before a holy God. Then God will strike me down dead. Christ is our high priest and there is no sin in him. Our text tells us that Christ is the reality that the high priest was pointing towards. He is our representative before God. As the Levitical high priest goes before God and represents all of the people of Israel to God, so Christ represents all of us. So Christ represents you before God even now. But he doesn't do so in an earthly temple or an earthly tabernacle as the Levitical high priest did. Our text tells us that he passed not through the outer court, and not through the holy place, but rather Christ passes through the heavens and he's gone into God's true abode, the true holy of ho- holies in heaven. And there he is the representative of all of God's people. And this is a reference to his ascension. We read in Acts 1, 9, Luke tells us, and when he, that is Jesus, had said these things, As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Christ ascends through the heavens. He goes through the heavens into the true tabernacle, into the true presence of God as our high priest. And Hebrews 1, 3 says, After making purification for sins, he, that is Christ, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ has made purification for our sins. As the high priest would slaughter the bull and the goat to purify the sins of Israel, so Christ himself has been slaughtered on our behalf, and he has made purification for our sins, and he is then able to go through the heavens into the holy place as our high priest, as our representative. But he's more than just a representative. He's also our forerunner. A forerunner is someone who goes before And wherever the forerunner goes, his people will follow after him. In Hebrews 6, 19-20, the author says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. So as our forerunner, we will follow him. And where Jesus has, has gone, we will go. Not just in a mystical sense, in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense as well. In the most real sense you can imagine, we will go where Christ has gone. And this is our great hope. And that, that's not to say that, that the mystical, spiritual reality is insignificant. That Christ representing us now, even now, before the Father is an insignificant thing. Rather, it's the source of much comfort and much hope for the Christian. And it's something that we should meditate upon and think about. God is inaccessible by virtue of his transcendence. He is, he's not limited by time or by space. But as creatures, we are spatial creatures. We're, we're temporal creatures. We're limited by these realities. We cannot make it to God on our own. He is transcendent. But he's also holy and he doesn't tolerate sin. And we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us meet God's standards of perfection. So none can come before him without being utterly destroyed. And this is what man was created to do in the first place, was to be in God's presence. To, he was created as Adam was created in the garden to dwell with God and to worship God and find joy and satisfaction there eternally but we've been separated from him. Our sin has separated us from him. However, he has made a way. And that's through Jesus, our high priest. Verse 15, the author tells us that Jesus, as our high priest, is sinless. He can enter God's presence by virtue of his own holiness. He doesn't have to worry about being destroyed by the holiness of God. More than that, not only is he holy, not only is he sinless, 
But verse 14 tells us that Jesus, our high priest, is the Son of God. That is, he is divine. He is God himself. He is transcendent. He himself is not limited by space or time. He can go into God's presence in a way that we never could. So by virtue of his divinity, by virtue of his sinlessness, by virtue of his holiness, by virtue of his transcendence, he can go into God's presence. And as he goes into God's presence, he takes us there with him as our representative, as our high priest. He is our access to God. There's no way to God without the priesthood of Christ. We cannot pray to God if Christ is not our high priest. We cannot come together on a Sunday morning and sing to God and think it's going to please him and think it's going to reach him unless Christ is our high priest. We cannot expect to find any blessings or any help from God unless Christ is our high priest. There is no access to him apart from Christ. So we can pray. We can worship. We can commune with God at the Lord's table. And we can know God's presence continually because we are seated with Christ in the heavenly holy of holies. Even now, even now, as you sit in your seats, you are seated with Christ in God's presence. So the author, in light of this truth, in light of the truth truth of Christ's priesthood, gives us an imperative. In verse 14, he says, hold fast your confession. Because Christ is your high priest, Christian, hold fast your confession. What is he, what is he speaking of? What is the confession? Well, the, the confession, quite simply put, is the truth of Christianity. That Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that he is my high priest. And that he is your high priest. And we must hold fast to the truth of Christ's priesthood and his intercession for us. Don't abandon the faith or reject Christ. Christ when trials come. Don't be the seed that's cast upon the rocky soil that that springs up because there's a little bit of soil there. But as soon as the sun comes out, as soon as the trials hit, we abandon the faith. Hold fast your confession. Why? Because you have a high priest. You have an intercessor. You have someone who goes to God on your behalf. Because his priesthood is the only thing that can get us through the trials of this life. Life. And his priesthood is the only thing that can bring us into the joys of the life to come. And holding fast to your confession does not simply mean that you speak the truths about Jesus and that you believe the truths of what he has done. Rather, you you make him your own. You confess Christ as your high priest. Not just that he is a high priest, but he is your high priest. Not just that he is a savior and he can save, but rather that he is your savior and he has saved you. Hold fast your confession because we have great needs. We have great trials. It brings us to the need of the believer. In verse 15, the author makes reference to our weaknesses. In verse 16, he implies that we do have needs. But of course, this is something that we already know, isn't it? As I said earlier, we're good at understanding what our needs are. We're beset with trials. Just take stress, for example. We're stressed professionally to stay at the top. We're we're stressed academically to to keep up our grades. We're we're stressed socially because we compare ourselves with other people. We have stresses in our relationships. We're stressed about our children. We're stressed about our parents. We're stressed about retirement. We, we panic about viruses. We're stressed about race relations. We, we, we're stressed out and we're panicked about riots and looting and protesting and national elections. All of these stresses add to one another and they compound. It's not like we're just dealing with one of these things. Many of us are deal, dealing with all of these things. And it's not insignificant. And for the believer, consider the persecution that you face. And I'm not trying to give into a victimhood mentality, but our Lord did tell us that because they hated me, they will hate you. And Christians do receive much persecution at the hands of the world. 
murder, martyrdom. It's not something that we face often in our own society, in our own nation, but it is something that Christians face on a regular basis for thousands of years around the world, even now. You, you can read stories of Christians that are losing their lives and their homes and their churches in Nigeria because they're Christians. We don't necessarily deal with martyrdom ourselves, but we do deal with mocking, don't we? That's very real. And that's a real form of persecution. That's not insignificant. As a Christian, will you believe that there's a transcendent God? As a Christian, you believe that there are moral norms that everyone is supposed to hold to? That's so antiquated. That's so old-fashioned. And, and we receive this form of intellectual persecution because they do think you're an idiot. They do think that Christians are morons. And why would they not? The world is of the devil. We do receive persecution. There's a trial that we undergo. But it's by no means the worst that we face. Illness, for example. Cancer. Many here have dealt with that. MS. Diabetes. And coronavirus. All of which are terrifying and frustrating and exhausting and expensive all at once. How do we deal with that? I know my need. I need to be healed. Where do I find healing? Depression. Where do I, how do I find joy? In death. We've all lost loved ones. Some of us have lost those who are closest to us. Some have lost spouses, children, friends. And when you go through that kind of grief, you hear things like, you know, time heals all wounds. So just give it time. Just go through the grieving period and you'll heal. It'll be fine. But it's been years and you know you'll wake up tomorrow and that pain will still be there. The same pain that you felt when you first lost them. How do you, how do you find joy in that? How do you overcome that grief? And some of you, even now, are near death, and you know it. You know you don't have much time on this earth, and that's, that's scary. That can cause even the strongest believers to lose hope. How do I know? What's, what's on the other side of this? It produces fear and uncertainty. And sometimes even just a desire to give up. Why even try? Why stay healthy? Death is a nasty, nasty business. And I could go on, but you're more than capable of filling in all the blanks of the ways in which we suffer, the great needs that we have as a fallen race. All of us have suffered to some extent. And some of you even in this room now have suffered to such an extent that the person sitting next to you could never bear it. Yet there is one who knows your suffering, and that's Jesus, your high priest. He knows your suffering, and he has unparalleled sympathy and understanding as your older brother. You know, many of us know what it's like to have a sympathetic friend, someone who understands, someone who um, on a regular basis prays for you, they listen for you, they're eager to help in any way that they can. As Romans 12, 15 tells us, they weep with those who weep, they mourn with those who mourn. But even the most sympathetic friend cannot fully understand what we go through. But Christ knows your pain intimately. He knows your suffering. And he weeps with those who weep in a way that no one ever could. He feels your hurt, and he feels your pain, and he knows what, it like, what it's like, and he cares. He does care. But more than that, he can actually do something about it. He knows the needs that suffering produces, and he knows exactly how to meet those needs. Verse 15 says that our high priest is tempted in every way as we are. The author here isn't saying that Jesus had sinful desires, 
Right? We know this because he goes on to say he was tempted in every way without sin. Temptation is not necessarily always a sinful desire. The perfect example of this was when Christ went out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and fasted and Satan comes to him and he tempts him with all the kingdoms of the world. He says, if you just bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, Christ already knew that all the kingdoms of the world were his. He already knew that he was king over all, but he also knew that he had to suffer in order to come into his kingdom. What Satan was offering him, he was saying, you don't have to suffer in order to have all of these kingdoms. This all can be yours without the suffering. That's the temptation. And Jesus was tempted to not go through the suffering, but he was never tempted to go against the will of his father. He did go through the sufferings. Martin Luther says, quote, Temptations, of course, cannot be avoided, but because we cannot prevent the birds from flying over our heads, there is no need that we should let the nest in our hair. It's when we let the birds nest in our hair and those temptations produce sinful, evil desires that temptations turn into sin. The temptations that Jesus faced were the temptations to forego suffering. But he went through all of it. He endured all the suffering, though he didn't have to. And he endured immense suffering for us. Consider all just the the mundane sufferings and and trials that we go through on a regular basis that Jesus didn't have to go through, but he did. Weakness, exhaustion, hunger. He was furthermore harassed by the leaders of his people. He was misunderstood by almost everyone, even his closest friends. He was betrayed and abandoned by his disciples. He was beaten. He was falsely accused. He was crucified and put to death torturously. And worst of all, he suffered the wrath of God for sins that he never committed. Christ endured immense suffering. So whatever suffering you're going through, or whatever suffering that you will go through in the future, you have a faithful high priest who is sympathetic. He knows what it is to suffer, and he suffers with you. We have great need, and and need that's that's commensurate to the suffering that we experience. But there's one thing that we need above all things, and that is redemption from our sin. We suffer under the weight of sin and death as if it were a, a building that's falling upon us, and we can't bring ourselves out from underneath it. But there is one who can. There is someone who can deliver us from the crushing weight of our own guilt. There's one who can deliver us from the just wrath of God that is to come. Indeed, our our needs are great and they can only be met by God. They can only be met by God. And this is why the, the priesthood of Christ is so precious to us. God is the only one who can meet our needs, yet God is inaccessible to us except through the priesthood of Christ. Because Christ can go before God, we can go before God. In light of our great need, and in light of Christ's priesthood, the author tells us to draw near with confidence in verse 16. And so we see the help that comes from God. Draw near to God. We no longer need to fear coming to God. As if we're going to suffer God's punishment and wrath. Because Christ is our high priest, we are no longer under his condemnation. Rather, we're under his fatherly love. We are his children. In any way that he relates to us, any action that he takes concerning us is done in love. The author is telling us that we can come to God and speak openly to him when we are in need, much as the psalmists do. As you read the psalms, sometimes you're shocked at the openness with which they speak to God. And God calls us to do that. We can do that. We must do that as we come before God because he's the only one who can help us. Draw near to God. We can come into God's presence, but it's not just draw near to God. Draw near to the throne of grace. 
Remember, as we talked about the mercy seat, the throne of God and the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, that's where God sat, it's where he ruled from. We have access to that throne. And for us as believers, it's the throne of grace. It's the place from which God dispenses grace and gifts and love to his people. So when we go to God in prayer, when we acknowledge his presence, we are coming before the throne of grace. But it's a throne of grace for believers only. And for anyone who's not trusting Christ, it's a throne of judgment. It's a place from which God dispenses his judgment and his wrath. So if you have not acknowledged the existence of God, if you have not trusted in, in Christ for your salvation, if you have trusted in your own good works as though you can save yourself and you think, I can relate to God based upon my own good deeds, there's no throne of grace for you. Rather, a throne of judgment. And even now, if you've not trusted Christ, you are under the judgment of God. But it's not too late. And no one is too far gone. Trust Christ. Confess him as your high priest. He will cleanse you of all your guilt and of all your sin. He will give you access to God. He will turn that judgment throne into a throne of grace. But for the believer, God sits on a throne of grace. Now take your needs to God in prayer. Your sickness, your stress, your depression, that sin in you that you've tried over and over and over to put to death, but it won't die. Take that to the throne of grace. Take it to God in prayer. We so often ignore God in our problems. We, we come against hard circumstances, and the first thing that we do is ignore God. We try to manage everything on our own. Am I in financial trouble? Well, I just got to reshuffle my finances and my budget and cut some pork out, and I'll be good. Maybe pick up a few extra hours here or there. Am I sick? I just go for the meds right away. Don't think about anything else. Am I depressed? I just go for the meds right away, right? Am I bitter towards someone? Have I allowed that bitterness to, to grow up into anger and in, then into murderous hatred? Do I brood upon it? I don't consider God. I don't go to God in prayer in my bitterness. Am I caught up in sin and, and what do I do? I, I try really, really hard to overcome that sin. And if I just try hard enough, then I'm going to be able to overcome the sin. And so we work, and we rely upon our own righteousness. Am I, am I worried about the state of my church, my community, my nation, my family? Am I faced with a difficult decision in which I need wisdom? The last thing that I do is pray. The last thing I do is go to God. I panic. Brothers and sisters, we don't pray as we ought to pray. We don't go to God first. We don't act as though God is the only one who can meet our needs. And of course, reshuffling your finances. Of course, going to the doctor. Those are all great things that you should do. But God is the one who meets our needs. God is the one who works in our circumstances to change us to bring us joy, to bring us closer to him. James tells us that we have not because we ask not. So believer, take your needs directly to God. Go to him in prayer. Don't brood over them. Don't try to fix all of your problems on your own. God has all that we could need. Do you need strength? Do you need wisdom? Do you need blessing? Do you need satisfaction? Do you need joy? It's all there. God dispenses it from his throne of grace. But we don't go there. Go to God. Spend time before the throne of grace. And don't just spend a moment there. In your private prayer life, don't be easily satisfied with just short, pithy prayers. I got to move on. I'll give it two minutes. Wrestle with God in your prayer. Like, like Jacob wrestled with God. You know, sometimes we read in Genesis 32 about Jacob wrestling with God and we clutch our pearls and say, I would never 
to be so disrespectful to wrestle with God. It's not disrespect for Jacob to wrestle with God. It's an act of faith. Jacob knows in the context there that his brother Esau is pursuing him and he thinks that Esau is going to kill him. And north, south, east, or west, there's no way of escape. Jacob knows that Esau is going to catch up with him the next morning. And so what does Jacob do? He goes to God in prayer. And God comes in a manifestation. And Jacob wrestles with God and he says, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Why? Because there was help coming from no other place. If, if God didn't bless him, he was a goner. Brothers and sisters, this is the situation that we find ourselves in so many times. Yet we go to God in our private prayer lives and think, if I just give it two minutes, well, I'll be fine. No, wrestle with God in your prayer. Don't let God go until he blesses you because you're not going to find help elsewhere. It's an exercise of faith. And we can come to God with confidence. The author tells us to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. This is difficult. This is something that we don't often think about. You know, the, the only thing worse than suffering is suffering as a result of your own foolishness and your own sin. Car accidents are the worst. But what makes them even worse is when the car accident is your fault. So you got people that are injured. There's a lot of liability, and it's your fault. You're the one that did it, right? The same thing in relationships. If you have a messed up relationship with someone, with a friend or family member, and you know it's messed up because you did it, it's your fault. Like, you don't have anyone else to blame. This is all on you. This happens to us when we consider our relationship to God. We mess up, we sin. And our first reaction is not to go to the throne of grace. Our first reaction is God is mad at me. So I can't go to him right now. I got to give him a little bit of space. I got to give him some time. I got to do some good things to kind of make up for the bad that I've done. And then I can go to God. We think that we're no longer worthy to come to him. He's now angry with us. He'll chase us away. But brothers and sisters, we were never worthy to come into his presence in the first place. Christ is worthy, and Christ is there, and Christ is our high priest. And as Christ is there, so we are there. And when, when God the Father looks upon us, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, and he gives us the love that he has given his son, Jesus Christ. We have a high priest who has cleansed us from all of our sin, past, present, and future. The Father is not angry with us. Rather, he wants us to come to him when we sin, in the midst of our sin, that we might receive grace and forgiveness and restoration. It is, after all, the throne of grace. So, brothers and sisters, when we come boldly to God, acknowledging our need of him, we receive grace and mercy in our, help of need, or in our time of need. Do you need his grace? Do you need his help? Go to him. And when we come to the throne of grace, we experience a joy that can't be found elsewhere. It's a, it's a joy that we search for in other things, but it's not there. It's a joy that we were created to experience, and it can be experienced only in our creator. Because in God's presence, we experience the sympathetic eternal love of our Father. And though we're sinful, we experience mercy. Though we've buried ourselves up to our eyeballs in problems, God's able to meet every one of our needs. He's able to lift every burden that we have and bestow grace upon us. And we realize that his presence is where we're meant to be. And we, we sing with David in Psalm 16, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're able to thank God for the suffering that he brings us. We're able to thank God for the trials that he gives us. Because in them he drives us to himself. We wouldn't go to the throne of grace. We wouldn't go before God if we didn't have such great needs. In these trials he drives us to himself. And the, the joy to be found in him far outweighs 
any of the light momentary afflictions, as Paul calls them, that we experience in this life. So brothers and sisters, go with confidence to the throne of grace. And not just for a moment. Remain there. Remain there perpetually. Stay there. Bask in the goodness and the mercy and the grace that God will undoubtedly provide for you there. And unbeliever, for those who have not trusted Christ, you don't need to live in constant fear of God. You don't need to live under the wrath and judgment of God. There is a priest who is able to represent you before the Father. Repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus Christ. He will cleanse you of all your guilt and sin. Go before the throne of grace. Replace that wrath with grace and find help in your time of need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a good father to us, and you have shown us your love in such extraordinary ways. I pray that you would take this word and that you would imprint it upon the hearts of your people, that they would be encouraged to live lives of holiness, that they would be encouraged to go before your throne of grace to receive help from you. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let us take hold of the willingness of God at the throne of grace. Amen. And that's where it all comes from. Wonderful message, son. Great message this morning. Amen. Mm, sing it loud.